Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here um, at the joint tag meeting of University of Miami and FAU. I'd like to thank Dan Miroff. This was his idea. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dan Miroff from Florida Atlantic University, and uh, I'm also here to welcome you to our joint tag meeting. And as, as we customarily do, we typically introduce ourselves. And why don't we start with the people in the room, and then we'll proceed to those who are online. Um, if you can state your name, your aff affiliation, and one sentence about yourself. But you're going to have to speak up loud, or, come, or you're going to have to go to the microphone to be heard. So. Or this one. <laughs> or this one here. Good morning, Ramana Carey, Chief Engineer, Solway Authority. You'd like to come in line? <laughs> Good morning, I'm Mary Beth Morrison, the Director of Environmental Programs for Solway Authority. Well, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> mic check, mic check. Good morning, my name is Dan Schauer. I'm Senior Principal Geologist with Geosyntec Consultants. Is this working? Uh, Nate Mayer, Director of Land Management Services for um, uh, Salt Waste Authority of Palm Beach County. Amy Hightower, Project Manager at CDM Smith. Manny Hernandez, Project Director at SES Engineers. Wes Henderson, Research Coordinator, Hinckley Center. Uh, Bisho Shaha, PhD candidate, Florida Atlantic University. Hi, good morning. This is Mohammed Fahim Saleh, doing Master's in Civil Environmental and Geometrics Engineering uh, at FAU. Hi, everyone. I am Sharmili Rahman. I am doing my Master's in Environmental Engineering at FAU. Uh, James Telson, Utilities Manager, SWA. I'd like to continue with those on the line. Um, I'm going down the list so that we can be more efficient in taking turns. Ashley? I'm an assistant professor in civil and environmental engineering. Okay, Athena? Hi, this is Athena Jones. I'm a graduate student at the University of Miami, and I've been working on the PFAS project in Lens Hilly Chase. Hillary? Hillary? Yes, this is Hillary Thornton. I'm a remedial project manager with USDA Region 4 in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm involved with the PFAS work at EPA. Thank you. Can we unmute the people that are on Adobe or no? They don't have mics right because there's a lot more people than my name that last <laughs> Okay. Anyone else on the telephone line that would like to introduce themselves? Okay, so I'm going to introduce the ones that are on Adobe Connect. Okay, well, the ones that I know about so far are Dave Phillips, Lee Krumholtz, John Merrill, Kavitha Dasu, Robert Sterner, David Myers, uh, and 24 other people. <laughs> oh, John C. Lang, she's important. We need to definitely have her on the line. Mary Maurer. Mary. Okay. Morton Barlaz. Morton Neil Barlaz. Kaufman. Barlaz. Neil uh, Kaufman? Yes. Okay. Uh, a Ram to, I had a, Tawari. Tawari. And a Rohan Sethi. A Rohan Sethi. Thank you so much. All right, well, we have a big group, both virtually and um, in person, so thank you all for being part of this uh, TAG meeting. 
Uh, during this tag meeting, we will, we've gone through the introductions. Uh, the first part is the University of Miami presentations on landfill leachate, PFAS and landfill leachates. We will then go to question and answers. Uh, for those who are on the, conf on the telephone, uh, we have a mic set up, which we will open up after the presentation so that you can ask questions. For those of you who are on Adobe Connect, you can post your questions in the chat room and then those questions will be brought up and we will repeat them here. At about 11.15, we will proceed into the FAU studies um, for presentations. There'll be a series of three presentations followed by questions and answers. And I wanna thank Romana for um, uh, getting us some lunch <laughs> after the meeting and if, virtually you can have a sandwich, but uh, not one of ours. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ditto the thank you to the Solid Waste Authority. This is wonderful. This is a beautiful venue, wonderful technical support here. I'm really thankful for that. So let's go ahead. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead with the PFAS, and I'm going to first start by introducing the research team um, who are listed here. I'm going to say a few words about them when we officially stop, start the presentation. I also would like to acknowledge the, the Hinckley Center for Solid and Hazardous Waste Management, the director, John Shirt, and the research coordinator, Wes, who's here in the audience. I also acknowledge our TAG committee. Um, on our TAG committee, we have representation from consultants, including Rula Deeb. Um, I also believe that Elizabeth Holloway will be joining us from Geosyntec, and we have representation here in the audience from Geosyntec, so thank you. We also have representation from academia, Mort Barlotz, thank you for being on the line, and Ashley Thompson um, from Florida Gulf Coast University. We also have strong representation from the EPA. John C. Lang works um, at North Carolina State University, but she's physically located at Research Triangle Park, EPA, um, in the lab of Mark Streiner. And she has been instrumental in um, the analysis portion of this particular project. Also acknowledge Thabit Tolomat um, in Cincinnati EPA, again, a, a strong supporter of our work, and Hillary Thornton as well uh, from Reason 4. We also have state representation, Corey Dolmore, represent representation from the chemical manufacturers. Also acknowledge the landfill operators. Um, we have representation from the private landfill operators including waste management. We have Elizabeth Fowler. I was also had an RSVP from Seth Ramily of waste management. We also have representation from the public landfills going from north to south, uh, Hillsborough County, Indian River County, Palm Beach County, Broward County, and Miami-Dade County. And again, we're very thankful for all the support we have received from the landfill operators. So I'd like to go ahead and start. Um, the title of the presentation is Per and Polyfluoral Alkyl Substances, PFAS. It's a long name, and I'm going to refer to it from PFAS from now on. So we're looking at PFAS in landfill leachates and also looking at it in full-scale treatment operations of landfill leachate. Um, I'm Helena Solo-Gabriel, professor at the University of Miami. I also wanted to acknowledge Athena Jones, a PhD student who played a critical role in getting us started on this particular project, especially during the proposal phase and during um, early last year uh, going to EPA and running the analysis there. And Hekai Zhang, a master's student who is assisting us with the second phase of our project, focusing in on sample collection and preparations. During this presentation, I'd like to provide the research motivation, a little bit of background on PFAS. PFAS is complex, there's a lot of acronyms, a lot of chemistry, and I'd like to give a little bit of background so that we can start categorizing those different types of PFASs into different bins, which makes it a little easier to follow. I'd like to describe our research objectives and our results to date. There are a lot of PFASs. There's over 3,000 PFASs. The most common PFAS are listed here, PFOA and PFOS. 
common uses of PFOA and PFOS are illustrated in these images. For PFOA, it's used in the Teflon making process, so it is found in, for example, cookware, anything that has Teflon um, typically has components of PFOA in it. PFOS is um, associated with a spray type um, water repellent that was traditionally added to clothing to help protect it from wetting. Uh, the, the trademark name was Scotchgard. Uh, an example of what, what Scotchgard or PFOS is capable of doing, we have a carpet here illustrated where there was a spill of wine, for example, but with treatment of PFOS, it beads up and therefore it doesn't soak into the fibers of the carpet. And so it's a very effective, both PFOA and PFOS are very effective at repelling all types of liquids, whether it be water or oils and grease. So it has a lot of really interesting properties that in the consumer market is very desirable. And as a result, these PFAS species are found throughout um, cus uh, customer products. And so in trying to handle these PFASs in the environment, they're spread out throughout different products. How do we capture the PFAS um, from these products? And one place is landfills. And that's one of the concepts that I want to make sure everyone leaves with, that if we're going to try to get these PFASs back out of the environment, landfills represent a key, or landfill leachate presents one key in which we can potentially do that. So these are just two species of PFAS. There are additional species of PFAS. This is another type called um, FTOH, or fluoro telomeres. And the fluoro telomeres are typically also found in consumer products, but typically in food products that are wrapped with paper type products. So an example here is the uh, popcorn bag that you put in the microwave oven, a granola wrapper, and even the paper that is li lines um, pizza boxes. So these, these compounds are are everywhere, essentially. So again, there's over 3,000 of them. They're used for a lot of different products, products such as Teflon parts, sealants, carpets, weather-resistant clothing, cookware, Teflon tape, dental floss, papers that come in contact with food. One use of PFAS that I'm not gonna emphasize in this presentation, but it's very important, um, is the use of PFAS in firefighting foams. Firefighting foams represent a very intense source of PFASs, but I consider them more of a point source. They're concerns because when you release these firefighting foams, they're uncontrolled at the end of the fire. So there is a strong need to handle these firefighting fighting foams after the event or to find alternatives. But that's a different issue that would be a uh, taken into account in a different way outside of landfills. Similarly, other sources of PFAS includes industrial production facilities. So there are companies that produce PFASs and they also serve as point sources of PFAS as well through their effluent wastes. And again, those would be handled in a separate way outside of landfills. The sources of PFAS that we're mostly concerned with and focusing on through the landfills are these diffuse sources, these non-point sources that are associated with consumer products. So at this point, I'd like to talk about the research motivation, and I'd like to hand it over to Athena. Thank you. So at, if at any point it becomes difficult to hear me, just let me know. But the research motivation for even getting involved with PISA, um, at least for me, was that in my hometown in Brick, New Jersey, it was discovered that the um, water supply contained a strikingly high amount of PFAS, considering um, that we drink water from basically a river nearby. And um, so I got to work on that project during an internship I had a few years back. You know, so it's very personal to me because I've definitely been drinking it for a long time. Um, so anyway, the route of exposure for PFAS uh, the three main um, PFAS can be, you know, you can be exposed by inhalation, ingestion, and absorption through the skin. Um, and it's found virtually everywhere in the world. 
there is no naturally occurring PFAS, so we know that when we find it, it's been produced by humans. And it's in the blood of over 99% of Americans, so likely everyone in the room and on the phone has some level of PFAS in their blood. And recently I've had the opportunity to look into the toxicological study associated with PFAS to delve even deeper into the motivation for why, why do we care? Why do we want to keep these things away from people? So on the next slide, I'll talk about some of my findings from my recent literature review. Um, health outcomes in epidemiological studies where people were incidentally exposed include kidney and bladder cancer, liver tumors and cancer, thyroid diseases, both hypo and hyper, and um, various hormonal changes. And one of the interesting toxins associated with the limer, uh, liver outcomes is increased cholesterol due to some of the mechanisms how the liver per, like processes are fat in the food. Um, in the in vivo, oh, the sound quality is now terrible. Uh-oh. Athena, would you like me to continue for you? Um, I'll just say a couple more things, and then by all means, unless it's really bad, like you can't hear me at all. We can hear you, but it's a little muffled, so if you speak slowly. Okay. One of the other very interesting pieces of the review was that in in vivo studies, which involve live animals, and even in those epidemiological studies, there were always differences in the health outcomes by gender. So gender of the animals, gender of the people involved. And children are at greater risk. And then there's also a lot more that is still unknown, which is, I think, the scariest part. That's all. Thank you, Athena. So overall, the health, there are significant health impacts associated with PFAS. It's in the majority of our blood, 99.9% uh, .9 of humans, and it is associated with various cancers, thyroid diseases, and so forth. Because of these health issues, the US EPA in 2016 issued a non-enforceable health advisory of 70 parts per trillion, which is the same as nanograms per liter, for the sum of those two PFAS species that I mentioned before, PFOA, the one associated with Teflon, and PFOS, the one associated with Scotchgard, just two of the 3,000, the sum of those two, no more than 70 parts per trillion in drinking water. It's non-enforceable, it's a, it's a guideline. Now a little bit on the PFAS chemistry. And one of the aspects that took a little while to figure out was what is the difference between poly and per fluorinated alkyl substances? If you look at PFAS, it consists of two parts. You have a carbon backbone chain consisting of carbon fluorines, and then we have a functional group on the other side. And for example, the functional group can be a carboxylic acid in the case of PFOA, or a sulfonatic acid in the case of um, PFOS. Now going back to poly per versus per, if you look on the left-hand side, if every single carbon in that backbone chain is attached to a fluorine, it's called per. But if you have some hydrogens attached to it, then it's considered poly. So depending on the number of, whether or not there are hydrogens or not, it would be called per versus poly. It's this backbone chain that gives it the ability to repel water, to repel grease, because of these carbon fluoride chains are very strong. Now, the functional group on the right-hand side, again, can consist of the carboxylic acid or the sulfonatic acid as examples, but there can be many other types of functional groups. And then it's that carbon fluoride chain that imparts those very interesting properties. If you think about fluorine and you look at it on the periodic table, it's on the upper right-hand side of the periodic table. And as you go up to the right in the periodic table, you have more electronegative um, atoms. 
So fluorine is at the very top. It's even higher than chlorine. So it's very electronegative. It really wants those electrons from the carbon and will not give them up. And so we end up with this, this chain of chlorine and fluorines that are very resistant. It doesn't want to break apart. Nothing can get into it. And so that's why it repels water, it repels oil, it repels grease. So as a result of these very strong carbon-fluorine bonds, it is resistant to degradation by water, hydrolysis, degradation by light, photolysis, and degradation by microorganisms or biodegradation. Because of its persistence, PFAS has a long half-life. The half-life in water is 92 years for PFOA, and for PFOS, it's 41 years. Again, it's because of these strong carbon-fluorine bonds. And also these chemicals, these two chemicals, PFOA and PFOS, have been around for a long time. They are the ones that we know the most about in terms of human health effects, in terms of their persistence in the environment. And it's because they've been manufactured since 1940. They've been around for decades. Interestingly, um, due to some of the pressures um, associated with regulations, PFOS was phased out in 2002 from its only manufacturer in the United States, and PFOA was phased out in 2015 from its eight manufacturers, again in the United States. It is still produced in other countries, but at least in the United States, it's not, no longer manufactured. In addition to PFOA and PFOS, as I mentioned before, the FTOH, which is the one associated with paper products that come in contact with food, the fluorotelomers, very similar in structure. If we look at the, um, uh, on the right-hand side, the chemical structure for 8,2 fluorotelomer, again, it has that eight carbon fluoride chain, so it has eight carbons with fluorides completely attached. But instead of having a carboxylic group on the end, it has a hydroxyl group. Um, so it's very similar in the sense that it still has that same chain, background chain, but the functional group is different. And so what they find in the environment is that even though we have FTOH, which is not currently regulated um, in terms of drinking water, um, there's no advisories on it in terms of drinking water, they find that this FTOH is what they call a precursor. It can convert in the environment to PFOA, which is the one that is um, currently under advisory. This hydroxyl group in the environment switches over to a carboxylic acid group. Similarly, there are alternative products to PFOA. Now PFOA and PFOS, the O stands for eight, octa, octa. So PFOA has an eight carbon backbone chain. PFOS also has an eight carbon backbone chain. But they've modified some of these formulations to have different lengths of chain. So the prefix HX stands for hexa, which stands for the number six. And so there's al alternatives such as PFHXA, um, which are now manufactured. They're more mobile in the environment. They have shorter half-lives in humans, but they don't really know um, the, the health impacts associated with it. So essentially, the chemical manufacturers, instead of producing PFOA, may produce PFHXA, which is this similar to PFOA, except it has a shorter carbon-fluorine chain. So here is a somewhat of a summary of a lot of the different chemicals that um, are associated with PFAS. On the left-hand side, uh, we have the uh, sulfonatic acid. The top left is the sulfonatic acids. And that can go anywhere from a carbon chain with four carbons. And the word B for butyl is the abbreviation for four in chemistry. So it can go from four carbon chain all the way up to a 10 carbon chain as an example. Similarly, oops, similarly the um, carboxylic acids, which are shown on the bottom left, um, those can go from four carbon chains to 12. On the right, top right, it looks like a sulfonatic acid group, but it has a nitrogen uh, attached to it. So you can get all different combinations of, of uh, functional groups on one side and all different combinations of lengths of carbon fluoride chain on the other side. So you can get all different combinations of different chemicals. 
And again, we have the fluoro telomer acids on the bottom right illustrated. And again, you can have all different combinations of carbon chains and um, functional groups. Now in the environment, PFAS is detected just about everywhere. It has been detected in the Arctic, in the Ar Arctic ice cap. It's not used there, but um, it is believed that it does get into the atmosphere and circulates globally and ends up in, in the North Pole. In rivers not affected by PFAS production facilities, the concentrations can be single digits to double digits nanograms per liter. In rivers that are impacted, thousands to tens of thousands of nanograms per liter. And for leachates from landfills that receive PFAS waste, so this would be extreme high levels uh, under the order of hundreds of thousands of nanograms per liter. Looking at landfills in particular, uh, this is the sum of PFOA and PFOS because we have a reference for those in terms of drinking water advisories. There are studies that have been conducted in the United States, in Europe, and in China. There is somewhat of a consistency, the PFOA that is a found in landfill leachates on the order of hundreds of nanograms per liter, the PFOS on the order of tens to 100. Now, in China, the numbers can be higher. Um, we believe that uh, these extreme numbers on the right um, can be due to landfills that are accepting wastes from production facilities. Um, you'll notice that a lot of these studies have low numbers of samples. The reason being that it's very complicated to analyze, it's very costly, and so these earlier studies to tend to have lower numbers. Um, but there are more recent studies, and I want to emphasize a recent study by John C. Lang, and she's on the line. Uh, she published it in 2017, where she looked at, I believe, 18 landfills and 95 la leachate samples for land municipal solid waste landfills in the United States, and um, categorized them and came up with averages for landfills in the U.S., and we will be referencing those concentrations um, later during the presentation. So, Summarizing um, issues associated with PFAS and its relationship to landfills, we know that PFAS are found in consumer products distributed throughout. Now, consu these consumer products will end up in a landfill at some point and generate potentially over time some leachate. This leachate may end up in a wastewater treatment plant. At the wastewater treatment plant, the PFASs tend to end up in the sludge or the biosolids. Those biosolids may go back to the landfill or can be used for agricultural purposes. If used in agriculture, they may be taken up by plants, by the grazing animals, ending up in our food, or they can run off uh, during storms, causing general environmental contamination that can then potentially impact our drinking water sources, resulting in this big cycle of these non-point sources of PFAS impacting people, and then also um, having a central role with landfills. All of this, this these cycles, at some point, uh, go through a landfill. And what we propose in terms of dealing with these diffuse sources of PFAS is to implement a treatment method, treatment of the leachate. So this would be one way in which the PFAS can be taken out of the environment through the treatment of landfill leachate. So that brings us to our research objectives. And our objectives were to go out and sample and analyze leachate samples for PFAS. Our focus has been in the state of Florida. We are funded through the Hinckley Center for Solid and Hazardous Waste Management that has a priority for Florida. Um, we went to various landfills. We um, identified landfills with leachate treatment systems. Unique features of our study were that we collected leachates from different types of landfills, including class three, waste to energy ash, construction demolition landfills in addition to municipal solid waste landfills. There have been no studies that have looked at ash leachate class three. There has been one study in Austria that looked at C&D leachate. Um, the way they classify C&D is different than we do in the United States, so this will be the first one that looks at C&D as defined in the United States. Uh, we also measured gas condensates, and we also measured treatment in the full-scale um, operation at, at landfills. So our sampling's illustrated here. Um, this is Athena in the image, and at each landfill we collected two half liter samples of leachate throughout the state of Florida. We documented the age of the landfill, the composition of the fill, and the climate. 
We also collected one set of samples we called, it was for PFAS analysis, we called that the EPA sample. And then another sample was the UM sample, which we considered a backup, and we also used that sample for pH measurements and for COD measurements. The way we collected the sample was either through spigots, which were ideal, but in many cases we had to go into the manholes that were very deep. Um, Athena devised a very uh, unique uh, sampling device with a, a zinc-coated chain and attached the bottle directly to the chain using a clamp and was able to sample directly into the bottle um, and was able to get samples from very, very shallow streams going through uh, the leachate collection systems. We also, um, in the sample collection process, uh, I usually go out, when we go out and do sampling, I have a mindset in terms of preventing cross-contamination, making sure we don't contaminate the sample. But in the case of PFAS, that mindset had to be very different. The reason being is that the tra traditional materials that we use to collect samples, like Teflon, um, paper products that don't absorb water, like labels, um, could have PFAS in them. So we had to sort of rethink everything that we do in order to make sure that we're not contaminating our samples. So in that case, we avoided, for example, blue ice packs. Uh, we avoided solvent gloves. We also worried about the the lotions and things that we would put on normally, such as sunscreen, insect repellents, you know, we, we worried about everything because those, those lotions, for example, can have PFAS compounds in them. So we avoided all, even our clothing, uh, we made sure we weren't wearing water resistant um, clothing that we would normally wear um, if we were sampling other things. So we questioned everything. We were very worried about whether or not our sampling procedure was um, clean enough to avoid the contamination. Uh, we were also very careful in the sense that we double bagged everything um, by sample, had blanks for every single sample we collected. We had a sample blank. We also had trip blanks. So actually we ended up with more blanks than actual samples. Um, and so to illustrate the sample blank is illustrated there um, the way we uh, ran that is as we were collecting our sample, before we collected it, we would take our deionized water bottle um, and open it and then collect our samples and then go back to our deionized water and close it up again uh, to control for whether or not we were getting any PFAS um, from the atmosphere um, in that process. Um, we also had to be very careful with the deionized water itself. We, had, we, were, we were in search of a deionized water maker that did not have Teflon parts. And we found one in the chemistry department at the university, and we used that. So we ended up collecting samples uh, on five different trips, and we batched those samples into two batches. The first set was a set um, of four samples illustrated there. And that first set we then took to EPA, Research Triangle Park, where John C. Lang um, actually ran the samples. We were there. She mentored us through the whole process but we wanted to know whether or not what we were doing was free of contamination. So we had the first batch of samples, and then we had a second batch of samples. The second batch of samples uh, we was a much longer set and included some samples from the first batch, including the class three, the CND, and the MSW. Uh, we weren't able to reanalyze the, can the gas condensate because once we froze that and defrosted it, it was, um, it was very hard. It, it turned almost into a like a solid, and it didn't really turn back into that thick vis viscous liquid that we can process. So, but we still um, utilized the data from the first set for the gas condensate. But we have reanalysis on the next three samples. In addition to that, we have additional MSW. We have at facility number three MSW that was treated. We have influent and effluent, and then at facility number five. Um, there's a question about what the waste material is. We're still working on confirming what waste material is at that landfill. It's most likely a combination of MSW and CND, and they also have treatment of in the influent and the effluent. So the leachate characterization, um, again, we mentioned that uh, we measure the pH, the COD, the age. Again, the CND influent effluent should be MSW, CND. Um, we're still working on tracking down the age of that landfill for facility number five. 
um, but the ages were anywhere from 18 to 34 years. The pH of the sample was interesting. Um, if we look at the pH, it varied all the way from six to about eight. S the samples that were six were ash, were from the ash landfill. So the ash landfill had the lowest pH. The one that we're still working on characterizing the waste, which we think is a combination of C and D and MSW, had the highest pH of about eight. In addition to that, our COD for the leachates varied from 14,000 for the MSW with gas condensate in it, all the way down to 700 for the MSW effluent, treated effluent of, from MSW. So we had a wide range of COD, and actually I thought we had a pretty wide range for pH, and I, I didn't expect such a large range. So the analysis part, again, um, during both, both batches um, were analyzed at EPA Research Triangle Park um, with the Actually, John C. Lang um, led us through the sample preparation process, and then she ran it through the GC instrument. Um, she works in Mark Streiner's lab, and they offered to analyze samples, 20 samples, without charge. I just want to emphasize that it's not only the, the money that was saved in terms of the analysis, but the opportunity of going to that lab and seeing it um, firsthand to be mentored by John C. in the process to have her run the samples and get her feedback on the interpretation of the data was, um, to me, the most valuable part of this particular um, collaboration. So uh, again, um, many thanks to EPA Research Triangle Park. The samples that we analyzed, what, what, what did we analyze for? As I mentioned, there's a lot of PFAS. Um, we targeted 11 PFAS species. The 11 are illustrated here. There were seven carboxylic acid PFAS species, um, going anywhere from the four carbon chain, the B, all the way to the 10 carbon chain, backbone chain, with the D. Um, in that is the PFOA, the one that we know more about, the, the one with the eight, with the O. We also analyzed for three sulfonated PFASs, going from four to eight, shown there. And then we also analyzed for one fluorotelomer, which is 5,3-fluorotelomer carboxylic acid. This fluorotelomer has a carbon backbone chain, a fluorinated carbon backbone chain of five carbons. That's the reason it has five, but then it has three carbons that are not fluorinated, so that's why it's called five and three. So the fluorinated ones, there's five, and then there's three that are not fluorinated. And the reason we chose the 5,3-fluorotelomer is out of all the chemicals we could have picked is because in John C. Lang's study, um, there were elevated levels of 5,3 in all of the landfills that she analyzed, so we decided to also look for the same chemical in this study to see if we can see the same thing. When it comes to the analysis, calibration is key. You have to get a calibration curve for every single chemical you analyze for, so we had to have some calibration for those 11 PFASs. The, um, so we purchased these, these standards from a chemical called Wellington Laboratories, and in addition to calibration standards, which we can buy, um, we also added internal standards to every sample. The internal standards were isotopically labeled, meaning that it, was, it had the same chemical formula as the target chemical we were looking at, but it had extra neutron on its, uh, in some of the carbons, I believe. And so you, the, the instrument that we're looking at can tell the differences in the mass because the extra neutron but chemically, those chemicals behave the same way. So we were able to add these internal standards that are isotopically labeled. They, chemically, they behave the same way, but you can detect it differently because of the different mass in the instrument used for measurements. The first step of the process after the internal standards are added is a filtration step. Um, here is an illustration of the filtration process. Uh, you can see the gas condensate sample there. It's a viscous, dark fluid. Um, it was tough to filter. It required a couple of filtrations. And here we see Athena uh, doing some filtrations at the University of Miami lab. The filtration done, was done in the first batch at EPA, but then once we learned the process, we did the filtration at the, back in the University of Miami lab. But at the EPA, of course, the solid phase extraction was conducted there which is illustrated here with the four leachate samples from the first batch. Underneath those leachate samples, there's these cartridges. These are wax cartridges 
that once the 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 leachate goes through, it captures the chemical, the target chemicals in that cartridge. And so once you capture the chemical in the cartridge, and you can see here in the yellow box, the black, the cartridge is turned to a black color. That's the leachate, the material from the leachate. Then there's a sequence of washing steps and cleaning steps. And then there's an eventual extraction of the target chemical from that cartridge with ammonium um, oxide a methanol solution. And then that was then put into a second cartridge, NV-carb cartridge, which is also, which is used to further clean up the sample to, by removing dyes, for example. So this whole process of solid phase extraction, this whole pre-processing step is to clean up the sample so that once you get it into this instrument, the GC or the LCMS, um, the instrument is capable of seeing the target um, chemical. This is the um, LCMS that was utilized as a time of flight LCMS. And we have John C. Lang there um, working on the instrument. Um, it's a very um, elaborate piece of equipment. And we were very um, fortunate that we were able to send our samples and process our samples at EPA Research Triangle Park. The first visit was by Athena Jones in January 2018. I went on the second visit on July 2018. Um, where John C. both trained Athena and I um, on the solvent extraction process and also illustrated the uh, LCMS analysis. So this is uh, me and John C. at the lab, and we're very, I was, we were very happy that we got to the end of the analysis. So this brings us to the results. Athena, you were going to do this part of the results. Would you like to go ahead and try, or do you want me to do it? Athena? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and proceed. I'm gonna keep the line on, open. So Athena, if you hear and you unmute yourself, you can let me know that you're there. If not, I'll go, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with uh, the target analysis from the first trip. Um, this first trip, again, Athena Jones was the one who went and uh, ran the samples and is very familiar and sat down with John C. face to face and went over this. Um, the interesting thing about this first trip, about the first trip, is we analyzed four samples, but our calibration curve wasn't perfect. The concentrations of the chemicals were higher than we expected. So in the second batch, what we did is we diluted everything by two to one, plus we made our calibration curve much wider. But from the first analysis, everything that was not captured by the calibration curve has a red bar around it. We still think there's a value to expressing what we think the concentrations are, but again, they were outside of the calibration curve. Now, adding in the average values that we would expect from John C. Lang's study, looking at MSW throughout the United States, as represented by the yellow bars here, the yellow bars are typical for municipal solid waste in the United States. What we find is, for example, the 5,3 FTCA is higher than what we would have expected. The PFBS, which has a four carbon chain, is higher in the MSW, whereas the PFHXS is higher in the class three and C and D landfill, landfill leachates. So what we're finding in our samples is, in some cases, it's towards the middle, we more or less in the vicinity of the average, but when it comes to the FTCA, the, in the sulfonated um, compounds, we tend to be higher. Now taking this data and only looking at the samples that were within calibration curve, we have it illustrated here. So all of these were within calibration curve. And again, um, taking a look at the PFOA and the PFOS. These are the ones that are regulated or have advisories on it, the health advisories taking the sum of the two because the advisory is based on the sum of the PFO and PFOS, using 700, 10 times the drinking water standard as a bar, as a rough estimate as to what may be acceptable in the environment of 700, we find that we have a factor of three or four above the 700 in our samples in terms of the average leachate for MSW landfills in the United States of 1,100, again, we're above that as well in those samples. 
So that brings us to the second set of results, which is the second EPA visit. Now this next slide is very busy. I will try to go through it as best I can because we have more data. It's hard to see, I apologize. Uh, we're currently trying to find ways to improve the presentation. Um, but what we have here and to emphasize is we brought the sample from the first batch, the gas condensate sample from the first batch to the second batch, just to have it as a basis of comparison. One of the items that we could not measure in the first batch were the low carbon chain um, PFASs. So the gas condensate can be higher. We just couldn't measure some of the species in the first batch. But in the second batch, everything was analyzed in duplicate. So that's why we have the bars to show the duplicate samples there. And what we see in terms of these samples is, to me, the most obvious is the ash. The ash samples, we can detect, first of all, we can detect PFAS and ash leachate, which there were some hypotheses that maybe the, the incineration process would get rid of all PFAS. Well, it does not. But also what's very interesting is that it's low. It's low relative to the other landfills, leachates. Um, and so uh, it's, we find it very interesting. It seems as though the ash, and remember the ash had the low pH, low pH associated with it. Maybe it's a pH issue, maybe the PFASs are getting broken apart in the incineration process. The temperature of incineration at this facility, the, this was a waste to energy facility, is on the order of 900 and something, 900, 960 degrees centigrade. And it is believed that PFASs in the laboratory are broken apart. It would be interesting to do document in full scale operation whether or not those PFASs are actually broken apart or do they get entrained somehow in the air. And I, I really do believe that that would be a priority to test what happens to the PFASs from the ash um, the, in, in the incineration process at a full-scale facility. Other landfills leachates that had lower levels of PFASs, such as at facility number three, um, used ash as their intermediate daily cover. And so it almost seems as though, depending on how much ash is mixed with the MSW, we may get lower levels of PFAS in those leachates. Again, at facility number one, there was some ash mixed in with the MSW. And again, that tended to be a lower sample. But looking at all the others in terms of the class three, what we call the C and D, and the MSW, they pretty much follow each other with the exception that the treated one, now if we look at the treated sample at uh, facility number three, there wasn't a big change in the PFAS levels before and after treatment, but at this facility, which had a high pH, there was a significant change in the PFAS levels um, in terms of before and after treatment. So that's really weird when you get a contaminant at higher levels after treatment than before treatment. And what we think is happening is that there are chemicals that we're not measuring that then convert over into PFAS in the treatment process. So essentially what this is a initial analysis, initial review of what we've been looking at. Ash, takeaway points are ash. Ash leachates tend to be low. Treatment does not necessarily reduce the, the amount of PFAS. It can actually re result in um, increases in PFAS. And also the degree to which the waste is mixed with other waste types can also affect the overall PFAS levels. Going back to our two PFAS species, the PFOA and the PFOS that are regulated, and combining them and comparing them to standards, um, we have the 700 as our guideline. And again, for drinking water, these two species are, regu are not regulated. There's an advisory of 70 nanograms per liter, multiplying that by 10. Again, our landfill leachates tend to be high in terms of these levels, except for the ash leachates and also high in terms of the average for landfills in the United States. The sulfonated acids were interesting. Um, it wasn't a consistent increase at all landfills. There were some landfills that high, had the high sulfonated, sulfonated acid in terms of the four carbon chain, the B, or in terms of the six carbon chain, HX, or in terms of the eight carbon chain, in terms of the O. So there was it almost seems like a hit or miss in terms of the sulfonated acid species at these landfills. The story about 5,3 FTCA can be very interesting. 
uh, if we look at the landfill that had its leachate treated, we saw that the five, remember this landfill had increases in P PFAS, but if we look at the F3 FTCA, there's a decrease in the FT3 FTCA at this particular landfill. So this is the landfill that underwent treatment and we have a loss of FTCA. Now remember the five stands for the five carbon chain, the three is carbon chain with the fluoride, and the three is another set of carbons. So this, this chemical has a backbone of five carbon chain. If we look at what we think it could be converted into, which is a five carbon carboxylic acid group, PE means pen, penta for five, we see an increase. So we see a decrease in the hydroxyl um, group, but then we see an increase when, the, in, when we look at the carboxylic functional group. So essentially, I, we think what's happening in the treatment of this particular sample is a conversion from FTCA into PF penta um, alkyl substances. So what we think is happening is that there's an interchange in the chemicals. Um, they, these PFASs are converting and transforming um, throughout the treatment process. So where are we going from here? Uh, we are in the process of doing a lot of things. Uh, we submitted a proposal to the EPA STAR grant. Um, this was in collaboration with Timothy Townsend, uh, Nicole Roby, who's in the audience, um, and we are proceeding um, along those lines. Uh, we have drafted a manuscript for this first phase, hope to get it out the door uh, within a month. Uh, we have a second study that we initiated. Um, it actually started yesterday, uh, October 18th, and um, in this second study, uh, we, um, it's, the, it's, it's a very similar relationship as with um, Research Triangle Park, where the samples will be analyzed for a series of PFAS species, and in this case, we're going to be analyzing for many more physical chemical parameters, such as BOD, COD, conductivity, and other chemicals. So um, this is where we are, and uh, we also plan to host a third TAG meeting at the end of 2019, hopefully describing some of the re additional results that we have. I'd like to acknowledge the Hinckley Center for funding the project. A big thanks to John Z. Lang and Mark Streiner for um, the expertise and the analysis. I'd like to thank the landfill staff who helped us with sample collection and our TAG members uh, for their time and feedback and also the staff at the University of Miami who helped with the logistics. So at this point, I'd like to ask if there are any questions. I know we have questions, may have questions here, in which case we need to use a microphone, and then I believe we also may have questions in the chat room. And we can give people a few minutes if they have questions in the chat room. So do we have any questions from the audience here? Don't be shy. I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, in your initial filtration step, do you think that maybe any of the compounds you were looking for may have been absorbed to the particles that got filtered out? That's a great question, um, and I al always worry about that. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we add the internal standard prior to filtration, so we can track whether or not it uh, was removed in the filtration process or remain behind. Okay, so. and I have a question from Elizabeth Hawley. Okay, hi Elizabeth. She asks, did you consider running TOP assay to measure total oxidizable precursors as well? I would love to. Um, we did not in this batch. And I would love to do TOP because that if we see no change before and after treatment, if we see no change in the TOP, it implies that it was simply a conversion from one PFAS to another. Um, by focusing in on specific species of PFAS, we could be missing that conversion. We may not be getting all of the chemicals and their conversion from one to the other. And I think the top analysis, total oxidizable precursors, um, 
would be a great way to sort of capture that 3,000 set of chemicals and in, in a bulk sense and try to understand what may be happen, happening through the treatment process. So yes, we would love to do TOPS, but we did not do it in this study. Yes. She has a follow-up question. Yes. She says, also I know New York State is doing a survey of PFAS concentrations in landfill leachate, and they have sampled at least 200 landfills to date. Ooh, wow. Okay. Uh, Martin Brand in the Office of Remediation and Materials Management is involved in the project. Sounds like a, that she's uh, giving you a comment, not really a question. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth, for that information uh, on what New York is doing in terms of PFAS. That's very helpful. So thank you for that contact. And we will communicate offline to follow up on that. We have one in the audience. But you have to go to uh, the microphone. You can come here. So uh, one of the sites you said they were treating their landfill leachate, and I was just curious of what kind of treatment they were doing. Okay, both sites that we analyzed um, treat through an aeration process. <laughs> one of them is a batch aeration process whereas the other one is a continuous flow aeration process. Um, but both of them utilize aeration. And the focus of that treatment is for ammonia removal as opposed to anything else. So they, they aerate with the hopes of reducing the ammonia. And uh, because of uh, when they discharge, both facilities discharge to a wastewater treatment plant so that the wastewater treatment plant would be more agreeable to accept their leachate waste. But it's an it's aeration process similar to activated sludge that involves aeration and some sort of settling. I have some more questions from, yes. uh, from the chat room. Is okay. that okay? In the, okay. Or do you want to go first? Let me. Yeah, let's have the audience. One from the audience. Thank you. Um, you mentioned regarding the length, the age of the landfill. Yes. Does that matter or would that impact the PFAS? based on the uh, life cycle of the cell itself? What I have read, I, our data doesn't show a trend. I think we don't have enough samples to really show a trend because not only do we have age, we have landfill type, and I think landfill type is trumping everything else that we see. But within a landfill type, um, I have read that, for example, the study from Austria, if the landfill is active versus um, closed. They have significantly different levels of PFAS. And if I remember correctly, I th think when it was open, the PFAS levels were higher. So. Yes, yeah, so the, I would presume that age does have an influence, but from what I read, it's more open versus closed. Um, John C., I, I know that you also, if you're on the line um, or in the chat room, uh, if you want to write a comment about that, um, in terms of your study, I know you studied um, the age as well. So maybe we can come back, circle back to that afterwards. But um, in terms of the age, I would presume that if the landfill is really old, before 1940s, um, those chemicals were not being produced. But during when those chemicals were produced at their peak, and I do believe that they're still peaking, but we now, PFOS and PFO in the United States is lower but now we have these alternative chemical species. So I would assume that depending on the age, there's different chemicals that are getting into the landfill, different types of PFAS, and then those would leach at different rates. Thank you. Okay. So I have a, a couple of comments. Uh, this is from Ram Tiwari. He says, um, though the focus of your study is landfill leachate, he wonders if recyclability of products with PFAS is also a concern, and also maybe utilization of biosolids from wastewater treatment at landfills too. Would they be a source of PFAS? Okay, well the biosolids is pretty much known that the PFAS accumulates in the biosolids, and there's a big concern because if those are recycled for agriculture, then we're essentially redistributing the PFAS out there in the environment with very little control. Um, as far as recycling of products, uh, that, that's an interesting question. I guess it depends on the level to which it's recycled, or you know, there could be reuse of clothing, 
you know, through goodwill and things, things like that, but a true recycle where you re um, shred the material and repackage it and have a new material altogether, again, um, I don't know. I think it would be interesting to see. Yeah. That's a good question. There's another question I don't know if you're allowed to answer, but uh, the question is, can you tell us the names of the landfills that were sampled? We promise to keep that confidential. I would love to tell you, yeah, but I can't. And actually, I have to forget, because I have to be careful not to inadvertently say, so I forget. I forgot. That's my answer. Okay. And Hillary Thornton is typing. OK. Thank you. She says the application of biosolids from the Dalton, Georgia area was looked into in the EPA Region 4. She doesn't remember the details but they have looked at um, PFAS and biosolids. So in the Dalton landfill, what, where is that? Georgia. Georgia. Okay, we'll look at that. I'll contact Hillary and see if we can track down that study. Okay. Thank you. It's a carpet producing area. Oh, yeah. That was brought up at our last tag by others. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, it looks like the chat room is a little quiet now. Okay, great. Okay. Any other comments or questions from the audience? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, generally what I saw in your presentation, and it was very well done, thank you, um, was a trend for class three and C and D landfills to have typically a higher concentration of these PFOS um, constituents. Is that a correct interpretation? Yeah, I mean, in terms of PFAS, given the data that we've collected so far, I don't see a difference between an MSW landfill and a C and D in a class three. They're in those material. I mean, it's in there. Okay. So. Interestingly enough, the class three and C and D landfills are generally less regulated when it comes to lining systems and other yes. things. Yet we see these typically higher concentrations just dictated why I assume would be the types of waste that goes in those types of facilities. Yeah, I would expect in C and D and class three, even though they're considered inert, um, what makes a you know what would make it inert? Um, and I think a lot of products that are considered inert have PFAS, a lot of paper products, a lot of uh, um, carpet, exam as an example, would have PFAS in it. Um, maybe even water repellents on wood, sealants, would have PFAS in them. So I can see where the opposite would be an issue where you have more PFAS and C and D in class three relative to MSW. But we still need to collect more data to confirm any particular trends between the two types of landfills. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think I think I'm done with questions. Is that correct? Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hi everybody, I'm, I'm Dan Miroff, I'm the uh, Associate Chair and uh, Professor in the Department of Civil, Environmental and Geomatics Engineering at Florida Atlantic University. And I just wanted to um, present to you uh, three of our projects that uh, we're working on with the Hinckley Center at the moment. And uh, we'll have those presentations by my students here in a second. <clears throat> Um, I'm really happy to be here today with uh, one of my former mentors. Uh, I, I went to the University of Miami, I got my PhD there, and there was somebody uh, very important in my career that was there. 
and I did my, my final postdoc before joining Florida Atlantic University under her tutelage. And when I joined FAU, I, I started the Laboratories for Engineered Environmental Solutions, which is Labbies, where we post all of our Hankley Center projects. And I'm also the college liaison for undergraduate research, where we try to bring in uh, students who are still at the bachelor's degree level and pair them up with some of our, our fine graduate students. And I'm also the college liaison for community engagement. And I'm doing research in all areas of environmental engineering, including STEM education. I did want to put a quick plug. I don't know how many of you know other PhD folks, but we have an advertisement coming out tomorrow for a new environmental engineering professor position at FAU. This person will be very fortunate because they'll get a chance to work at uh, the Davie campus of FAU in a LEED Platinum building with a brand new laboratory fully equipped by me. And the laboratory will also be uh, a named laboratory, so you'll already come in with money. So we're hoping to attract someone, who, a high caliber researcher in the field of air pollution research. In terms of the uh, recent research that we're doing in my lab, uh, on top of the stuff that we do with the Hinckley Center, and I know some of my former students are in the Adobe chat rooms right now, so I want to give a shout out to um, Rohan Sethi, who is in California, I think, at the moment. And he did a, a very fine work that just finished up this summer. And all these projects are on, on our website. The link is coming up here in a second. And I really invite all of you to go in and take a look and, and provide some comments and feedback. We also have uh, the, the, our second pr presentation today was, uh, is piggybacking on previous work that was done by two of our students. I think one of them wanted to be here today, but uh, her boss gave her too much work to do. <laughs> but her boss is here in the room, so he's, he will uh, go back and tell her everything that's going on. On that particular project, there are two uh, small PDFs that really needs some comment from landfill operators so that that research can continue. So I invite you to go to, those, uh, to that page and check it out. That particular project, uh, we got funding from the EREF to continue that work. And uh, other projects that we're doing right now, I'm collaborating with another one of my uh, mentors from the University of Miami, uh, Dr. Waite, who is at Florida Tech, which is where I did my bachelor's degree. And we're doing some work on electron beam research, which is, he was my uh, PhD advisor, and I did my PhD on electron beam research. So now it's come back full cycle, uh, several decades later, it seems. Uh, we're starting a new project on the impacts of phosphorus from on-site treatment and disposal systems, which you know as septic tanks. And we've done some work here at the uh, Solid Waste Authority particularly on the, um, the leachate disposal well, or the in, in deep injection well, and some of the microbiology that's down there. And I think that one of our students will mention a tiny bit about that. And we're finishing up our NSF STEM grant that is uh, the LEARN program that we have in conjunction with University of Central Florida and Western Carolina. So first we'll have um, the electrochemical oxidation of leachate project, which is coming, uh, getting close to ending. Uh, this will be, uh, Fahim will, will speak first. And then our newest member to the team, Sharmili, will speak about the odor biosensor. And then um, Bisho, we hope, will be my first PhD student that graduates uh, very soon in the, in the following year here in 2019 and he'll be talking about his work on leachate clogging. So I just wanted to mention again that there's two projects that just finished, that the final reports are on our website, and that would be the, it basically was a two-year study on the uh, effective odor control strategies, where we actually developed some of the work that Sharmili will be talking about today, and then when we finished up our food waste uh, diversion project is also there. 
So that's the website if you want to go take a look. It's got the QR code so you can take a picture with your <laughs> cell phone or type in the longer version. And it was, it's on the bottom of the Adobe Connect as well. And I do want to mention that um, I, this year has been a, <laughs> a good year for the Mira family. We, um, we were so very, very lucky to be matched for adoption. And uh, my two boys, Dylan and Cassidy, they are actually uh, the, they're from the same birth parents. So it, they are just super fantastic. Today they're both sick, of course, home from school, which means daddy didn't get any sleep. But if you forgive me, <laughs> I just love showing their pictures everywhere. And this is my card for, um, you know, if you want to contact me at any time. My, my telephone number doesn't work because the uh, building in which my office used to be located is being under renovation and reconstruction. But the uh, email still works, it, so you can come contact me anytime. So I'll pass over the microphone to Fahim. Uh, hello everyone, this is Mohammed Fahim Salek, uh, doing Masters in Environmental Engineering at Florida Atlantic University. So my, the topic of my research is landfill leachate treatment by advanced electrochemical oxidation. So I think everyone here knows that what leachate is, but for those who doesn't know, uh, leachate is the liquid that drains out from landfill. So when it rains, the uh, rainwater percolates through the landfill and it extracts constituents from it. As it has higher amount of organic chemicals and toxicant, it has become a poten potential threat to soil, surface water, and also groundwater. And moreover, it has detrimental effect to our environment, ecological, uh, ecology, food chain, and uh, uh, leading to uh, detrimental effect uh, uh, and uh, carcinogenic effect uh, among human beings. Currently, leachate is uh, uh, managed by either uh, deep well injection, on-site treatment, or mixing uh, with municipal wastewater. So according to a study by University of Central Florida, in 2013, uh, about 2.2 uh, billion gallons of uh, leachate is being generated in Florida, only in Florida. And in 2014, the number is 2.1 billion gallons. And most of it is uh, discharged to wastewater treatment plants. And only a little portion of it, like 3%, is discharged directly uh, to um, the water body after on-site treatment. Uh, but nowadays, the option of uh, discharging to wastewater treatment plant is um, limited because the wastewater treatment plants are uh, charging, charging high if the parameters are above certain limits. Uh, um, I would like to mention that Broward County is uh, charging 350K per year for discharging wastewater uh, to the, uh, to discharge the land, uh, landfill leachate to the wastewater treatment plants. So our goal is to treat the le landfill leachate uh, cheaper than that cost so the landfill operators might get interest in our um, research. So researchers have been trying different methods to treat the landfill leachate. Uh, one promising method is electrochemical oxidation. Uh, it has been successfully used for treating wastewater from tanneries, power plants, municipal areas, and in some cases for landfills. So how does it work? Uh, generally, it uh, uh, oxidizes pollutants uh, at the anode. Uh, moreover, it uh, generates hydroxyl radicals uh, chlorine, hypochlorite, and other oxidants. So uh, those involved in the indirect oxida oxidation of the pollutants. So uh, we have two objectives for uh, our research. So the first objective is to do uh, laboratory experiment uh, a couple, uh, to find out the efficiency of electrochemical oxidation coupled with other pretreatment process uh, to remove certain uh, parameters of in, uh, interest like the COD, BOD, ammonia, turbidity, so that the uh, le landfill leachate can be discharged um, uh, to the wastewater treatment plants. 
we are trying to do some pretreatment before the electrochemical oxidation to uh, maintain the cost lower. And our sub second objective is to assess and monitor the halogenated byproduct uh, generated dur during the treatment process. So our total, uh, our um, methodology has been divided into five tasks. The first task uh, was to collect data on electrochemical oxidation, then performing laboratory scale experiments, assessing treatment performance and byproduct generation, and finally developing um, a recommendation and preliminary cost analysis. So the first task was to collect data on electrochemical oxidation. I, uh, I have reviewed a couple of uh, research articles uh, and try to uh, put everything in a tabular form. So we can see that the electrochemical oxidation depends on a couple of uh, parameters like the anode material, current density, volume of the sample, duration of the process, um, amount of chlorine present in the leachate. So in the first three row, we can see that they, the researchers have used titanium and uh, coated with rubidium iridium oxide. So we have uh, same kind of experimental setup in our lab. So the researchers, uh, researchers got maximum COD removal of 44% of COD and 50% of uh, ammonia. So our goal is to uh, do better performance uh, than these results. So I use this table uh, as a guidance. Uh, so we have uh, four different types of uh, experimental setup. Uh, one is provided by uh, the Origin Clear Company, and another electrochemical oxidation reactor is provided by the Magnelli, uh, uh, Magnelli uh, materials. So, and uh, moreover, we have uh, developed an ozone reactor in our lab, and currently I'm doing the phantom coagulation. So here we can see the treatment process flow, uh, flow diagram. As I have uh, said before, we are doing some pretreatment. So first I have tried uh, two-stage electrochemical oxidation. First in origin clear electrochemical oxidation, then I've put the uh, leachate sample in the Magnelli reactor. Then I have tried ozone as a pretreatment before the electrochemical oxidation, and currently I'm doing, I'm trying the phantom coagulation as a pretreatment before the origin clear electrochemical oxidation. Okay, thank you. So here's the uh, picture of uh, the experimental setup of the origin clear reactor. It's uh, very basic open reactor. Uh, we can see the, can I find? Okay. So the mesh-like uh, mesh -like tube is the cathode and inside this tube uh, we have the anode. So we have total three, number, uh, three numbers of uh, uh, anode inside the reactor and those are connected with an external power supply. So this experimental setup is provided by the Origin Clear company. Uh, then we have uh, the Magnelli reactor. It's, it's a closed chamber, uh, and uh, uh, the the anode and the cathode is placed inside the reactor. Uh, uh, the leachate sample is uh, placed in the container, and it is pumped and circulated through the chamber uh, using a pump and the anode and cathode is connected with an external power supply. And we have developed an experimental setup uh, to do ozonation for the leachate. So we have a 20 gram per hour capacity ozone generator, which is connected with the oxygen cylinder, uh, which is fed by a, a pure oxygen. And the other end of the ozone generator is connected with a diffuser to make smaller bubbles so that the ozone can get mixed with the leachate very easily. Um, moreover, we have put a mechanical mix mixer from the top uh, to get better mixing. And uh, we have uh, placed a tray at the top uh, at, at a certain height to collect the foam uh, overflown from the top. So here are the test details. I have already discussed some of, uh, some of it, but I would like to mention some of the things here. Uh, the voltage range was around 5 to 6 voltage. Um, 
and the ampere age was about uh, 25 to 30 amperes. We ran the experiments for uh, 60 minutes in each of the experimental setup. And uh, we have a capacity of four liters um, at a time. And for the ozone reactor, uh, the, uh, the dosage is uh, 20 grams per hour uh, at a pressure of five PSI. And the column height uh, is, uh, is uh, about uh, two feet here, uh, which can treat uh, about up to uh, four liters of leachate at a time. So here are the sample details. I'd like to thank Solid Waste Authority, Palm Beach County, uh, to provide us leachate sample as much as we want. So uh, the pH of the sample is kind of neutral, ranging from uh, about 7 to 7.5. The COD ranges from 6,000 to 9,500 milligram per liter oxygen. Uh, the BOD COD ratio is very low. Oh, there is a little mistake here. The BOD COD ratio is 0 .0, uh, 0 0.05 to 0 0.07. Uh, it indicates that it has high, uh, high amount of recalcitrant organics, uh, which is not uh, biodegradable. Uh, the ammonia ranges from 2,500 to 3,200 milligrams per liter, and we have a chloride amount of about 12.5 grams to 13.8 grams per liter. So uh, we don't have, we did not have to add additional amount of chloride for, uh, for the indirect electrochemical oxidation. And turbidity was uh, beyond the limit of the turbidity meter detection. Uh, here, I would like to share uh, some of my results. So uh, we did the two-stage electrochemical oxidation. In first 60 minutes, the leachate sample was put in the origin clear reactor. Then I uh, decanted the leachate sample from the origin clear reactor to the Magnelli reactor. So during my, uh, my experiment, I have observed that the pH goes down uh, very quickly during the process. So to maintain the pH around seven, uh, we have tried two approaches. One is addition of baking soda, and another is addition of air. So here the orange line indicates the addition of air, and the blue line indicates the uh, results of addition of baking soda. Uh, both of them, both of the lines are quite similar, but uh, with addition of lime, we could not go beyond 90 minutes as the pH was around too, and I could not proceed uh, further uh, electrochemical oxidation. So here we got uh, around uh, 40, around 55% uh, removal of COD with uh, adding baking soda, and uh, ammonia removal was around 96%, which is very uh, good. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the setup is doing good at uh, removing ammonia. So here, uh, the graphs uh, the show the results of uh, ozone. Um, uh, so I have tried 40, initial 40 minutes in the ozonation, and then I put the leachate sample in the electrochemical oxidation. So with ozone as a pretreatment, the overall performance was not uh, that much good as the electrochemical, two-stage electrochemical process. So here we got like 30% removal of COD and 45% uh, removal of ammonia. So here we tried two processes, with, uh, one with mechanical mixer and another with without mechanical mixer. The blue line indicates without mixing and uh, the orange line indicates uh, with mixing. Uh, both of them are uh, quite similar, I think. So here uh, uh, I have summed up all the results in a single table. So the gray line indicates here the turbidity removal efficiency. So in each of the cases, the turbidity removal wa was quite good, uh, almost 97 to 98%. Uh, but I got a good result at the two-stage electrochemical oxidation as I mentioned before, like 95% removal of ammonia and 55% removal of uh, COD. 
So currently I am trying to do Fenton coagulation as a pretreatment before the electrochemical oxidation process. So the steps with uh, Fenton coagulation is to uh, first I have to brought down the pH below 3 so that the uh, iron uh, does not uh, precipitate. Then also I, I, I'd like to uh, mention here that the Fenton is a very good oxidant. Uh, it, um, um, uh, we prepared it with uh, a ferrous sulfate, ferrous salt, uh, mixing with hydrogen peroxide. So after adjusting the pH, I have added uh, Fenton, uh, the ferrous sulfate salt, then I have added uh, hydrogen peroxide, then the mixing was done for two hours with uh, a magnetic stirrer uh, at a speed of 1000 rotation per minute. Then it was kept uh, at rest for more uh, three hours. Um, the second picture sh shows the precipitation after the settlement of the sludge. So here I would like to share some of the results from the Fenton treatment. I did not um, uh, couple it with the electrochemical oxidation. It's only result from the Fenton treatment. Uh, so uh, this, this graph shows the results of Fenton treatment at different ferrous sulfate and uh, peroxide, hydrogen peroxide molar ratios. So the Fenton treatment depends on various uh, parameters like the P initial pH, uh, ferrous sulfate, to hydrogen peroxide ratio, amount of the salt, and lots of other things. So now I'm trying to find an, an optimal dosage for the Fenton treatment. So I have uh, seen that with one is to one ratio of the ferrous sulfate salt to hydrogen peroxide, I got about 48% uh, removal of COD. But in the case of Fenton treatment, the removal efficiency for uh, ammonia was not that much satisfactory. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned before that the electrochemical oxidation is very good at uh, removing ammonia. So I think it's going to be a good, uh, it's going to be, uh, going to be make a good couple with uh, uh, Fenton and the electrochemical oxidation. So here, uh, the task for is to assess the byproduct uh, generation. I, I haven't started yet, but um, this is my future task I'm going to do. Uh, the treating of landfill leachate can produce byproduct like uh, halogen, halogen to byproduct like trihalomethane, as there is organic and chlorine present in the leachate, and it can be as much high as 20,000 parts per billion. It's extremely higher than the US EPS maximum um, contaminant level, which is 80 uh, milligram per liter uh, for drinking water. So my approach is I would like to try maintaining the pH above seven so that combustion is, uh, uh, combustion uh, occurs and uh, each, uh, it uh, generates less halogenated products. Uh, then I'll try to uh, trap some gas uh, from the process and try to analyze using gas chromatography, mass spectroscopy. So here are my next steps to study the detection using gas chromatography, mass spectroscopy, GCMC or LCMS and treatment of the halogenated byproduct. And finally, I'd like to do cost analysis and comparison with other existing methods. So here is a list of challenges that I'm facing. I would like to have some expert comments on this. So foam has become a very big issue in during uh, for my experiments. So uh, every time I need a uh, twice bigger container uh, because of the foam. So I'd like to have uh, expert comments from here. So how to avoid the foam or what I can do uh, so that least foam is produced. And the second challenge is uh, during Fenton coagulation oxidation, uh, uh, a lot of sludge is produced. So how can I manage the sludge, uh, sludge produced during the Fenton coagulation? And the third one is the byproduct uh, gases. How can I manage the byproduct gases? So thank you very much. So any question and comments on these questions?
He is, sure. Uh, my question uh, mm -hmm. is in terms of, um, I find the treatment process is very fascinating, very mm -hmm. um, positive. Mm -hmm. In given what you know about the process, uh, you know, I just presented on PFAS. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, any of these processes have potential in the treatment of PFAS? I think electrochemical um, oxidation is um, very, very interesting, and uh, I think it can remove the PFAS too. I, I'm not sure. I have to try <laughs> that. But I think it can uh, remove the PFAS. And I think you, you, you have mentioned that you are also doing some aeration to remove ammonia. Um, I'm not doing, the landfills are doing aeration. Okay, oh, landfills are doing, but uh, the, uh, the electrochemical oxidation is very good at removing ammonia from the landfill leachate. Hello? Uh, please speak directly into the microphone. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so it sounds like you need to have a influent and effluent sample to send to either University of Miami or the Research Triangle <laughs> to see what happens yes. to this PFAS. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.